So for that reason, uh, we'll slow things down a little bit. Um, we'll it will, um, for the Q&A session particularly, uh, Susan will move down uh, behind each of the persons who are uh, who are answering questions when the Q&A starts. So if you can just uh, bear with us for that, it's um, it's um, but it is important. So we'll do that. Now I'm just going to ask uh, as you look at them from left to right, just to introduce themselves. Joe Ryan, National Director of National Services and HSE. Paul Reid, CEO of HSE. Sarah Doyle, Consultant in Public Health Medicine. Mm -hmm. HSE, uh, Lead for Entry Program Resistance Infection Control, Mark Cormick. Okay, and I'm Paul Connors. Um, okay, so um, we'll kick off then, we'll start off with uh, with an update on winter and winter planning and how that's, how that's uh, being implemented and progressing. So Joe, Okay, um, so we are still in what we regard as the winter season. Um, so our attendances this week are slightly up on last week, but down on the previous year in our general population. And our admissions would be the same, would be more or less the same as last week, uh, but down again on the same period last year. Our admissions are slightly up uh, in relation to both last week and last year, sorry, our attendances in terms of our over 75s are up, uh, as also our, our admissions in 75 year olds uh, up as well. Um, patient experience times, uh, both of the key measures there have improved over the last couple of weeks. Uh, our general population, 95.8% uh, of people were either admitted or discharged from the ED 24 hours, within 24 hours of, of registration. Uh, in terms of our over 75s, uh, we are at 57.6% of people who have been discharged or admitted uh, within the uh, nine hour threshold. Uh, our trolley count is down. Uh, it's down to 294 today. Uh, that's down on last year by 19.7%. Uh, uh, the average over the past seven days is down uh, by 3.6% over the same period last year. Our delayed transfers of care or delayed discharges, as you may have previously understood them to be, uh, remain in and around the 600, uh, around 640, there are thereabouts. Uh, but as I've done previously, I draw your attention to the rotation within that overall number means that we're putting much more people through those beds. So we've gotten that uh, delayed transfer of care bed days lost number down to about 35,000. Uh, remember at the start of winter that was at 55,000. That's achieved by maintaining, as you can see in the bottom left of the, the screen, that we're maintaining our uh, transitional care bed allocation at a relatively high number, uh, 224 in the last week. So in summary, uh, ED attendances have increased um, last week but remain lower than last year. Uh, in our over 75s, it's up on attendance and up on admissions. And at 8 a.m. this morning, there were 294 patients on trolleys. And I'll pass you over to, to Paul. Paul. Yeah. Thank you, Paul. Thank you. Good afternoon, everybody. I want to give you a quick overview of the actions we've been taking within the HSE over the last few days. Our engagement and continuing engagement obviously through the National Public Health Emergency Team and our priority focus over the coming period uh, as we still remain in the containment phase uh, prepare ourselves uh, for further phases. First of all, just to restate, uh, we know that we are dealing with a novel virus a new virus and the learning experience uh, from it is still emerging, which makes it all the very more challenging. We know from experience and what we've seen that there has been sustained transmission in more countries, especially in Europe and the UK. In terms of the current position that we're in right now, you, know, you may have seen we have completed over 400 tests 
uh, to date in our National Viral Reference Laboratory. And you'll know at this stage we have nine cases in total on the island, uh, six cases in the Republic of Ireland, uh, three north of the border. And you'll be well aware of the four cases uh, identified yesterday, positive cases uh, in the West. All of those cases uh, have been uh, placed in infection control environments uh, and are being treated for in that manner. Um, which does pose a very significant tracing challenge in terms of the scale uh, of those cases that we're dealing with and the reach and that process is continuing. Continuing made very good progress overnight uh, but still continuing. All cases to date have been associated with travel from northern Italy. Just briefly on the case earlier this week, at the east of the country, um, we took a very proactive engagement with the relevant areas involved uh, and decisions were made very promptly uh, with the communities involved. The pub public representatives for the area were briefed in a level of detail uh, earlier in the week as the case emerged and our communications teams and our public health teams engaged in a very significant uh, briefing, uh, particularly with uh, parents of the school associated in that case. And that will continue to be a model in whatever cases uh, emerge. In that case, obviously, we are continuing and will be continuing with restricted movement uh, of identified contacts. And we are in daily text message contact uh, and engagement from our public health teams uh, with all people involved in that one. And the helpline, our helpline continues to provide advice. We are still in containment phase. However, we know we're in a very challenge, challenging phase uh, right now in terms of sustaining uh, the containment phase. Particularly the ECDC and their classification now moved, from moderate, moved to moderate to high. However, all of our previous actions and a call to arms, if you like, for the public remain very strong and very true and very needed. And I'll come back to that just before I do close. If you look at the scale in terms of what's happened over the last week in particular, in terms of the level of attack of this virus across some European countries, if you just take Italy and the UK, for example. In Italy, uh, just a week ago, about 400 uh, test, post, positive tests. Um, a week later, uh, over 3,000 uh, cases and 12 deaths. In the UK, just a short time ago, 13 cases, now dealing with 51 positive cases. So we see the level um, that it progresses very, very quickly. I just want to give you a very brief overview of the actions that we've been taking at the National Crisis Management Team in the HSE over the past week. We've met three further times this week, and it's the ultimate priority for the HSE at this point in time. Yesterday, we launched the, we know that the level of demand that this can have the potential on our acute hospital system, and we know that we have to do things very differently as we scale up into any other phase. We've launched yesterday the National Ambulance Service home testing uh, has commenced, uh, which is giving and will give us a very significant support for the acute hospital system. And what our National Ambulance Paramedics crews are going out uh, and to the home primarily, uh, they do go out after advice from the public health doctors. So somebody contacts through our HC live site, through the public health doctors and our par paramedics are dispatched. Uh, and in the home, or at that point, they, car they carry out a few, I guess, assessments and tests. One, a very focused um, clinical assessment uh, of the person. Secondly, an environmental assessment of the person, the location that they're at, uh, the capacity for it to be isolated, I suppose, in some extent, or how many people in the home. Um, thirdly, the actual tests themselves, which the swab test, uh, our nasal and swab tests and finally uh, giving the people there an information pack so I think this is a very significant step that we've taken which is very different 
uh, than we've done things previously and will provide a level of relief to our acute hospital system. Secondly, we made a decision this week, which has been supported, to invest 20 million euros to bring on more ICU bed capacity all across our acute hospital, hospital system. 20 ICU beds that we believe can be brought on reasonably quickly and a further five that can be brought on uh, in a shorter, in a, a more medium term phase. It also involves an investment, a further investment in our national isolation unit in the Matter Hospital. Along with that, we've made a decision, and I know Joe was just talking to you about uh, winter, but we had some funding in terms of beds uh, to provide relief during the winter. We're going to extend those beds for a period of, of time, and that decision has been made also, and we'll continuously review that. We're obviously continuing to monitor the market uh, overall in terms of personal protective equipment and indeed pharma and medical supplies. And that's something our procurement teams remain very focused on and you know that the National Public Health Emergency Team have set up a group to continuously look at the market in terms of medical and drug supplies. We overall have invested, at the very least, about 20 million euros in purchasing of equipment, uh, uh, kits for our GPs, 13,500 kits distributed to our GPs, I mentioned the numbers just at our last briefing, over four and a half million gloves, almost five million masks, uh, between surgical masks and regular masks. So we're continuously making sure we have a supply and we have a very good steady supply committed. Also the purchase of ventilators uh, to support our acute system. We're continuing to work on the modelling uh, and the modelling is emerging as people get more understanding of how the virus spreads and our modelling is continuing with our national public health teams uh, and indeed in consultation with other experts across the world and indeed in the UK. You'll be familiar from the national public health emergency team communications uh, that the policy and document around mass gatherings is being finalised between ourselves and indeed um, the, the NEPA team. We're also focusing and looking at vulnerable groups and what actions we can take and that will be a specific focus again of the public health team in terms of looking at vulnerable groups and what supports we can provide in, in those settings or to those people. I just want to briefly touch on you because it has been a question we've been asked regularly in terms of ICU surge capacity. So I mentioned we have made the investment uh, overall uh, in, in giving us greater capability. Firstly, I acknowledge the pressures that's currently on our system and the demands that's on our system. So we have to be conscious of that and how we scale up from there. We're looking at any delayed discharges that are in our hospitals right now and how we can progress uh, those people through different settings and indeed relieve the pressure on the acute hospital system. Isolation units have been identified all across all of our hospitals. Indeed, I spent some time yesterday in St. James's Hospital, just up the road, and with the teams in there and with the teams in the emergency department, working through the pathways of which if someone's presented, how uh, it pro progresses through from isolation unit to ICU in a unit if required, etc. And so each hospital has working through those pathways and has worked through those plans. They're also developing their own surge capacity in terms of how they scale up. Obviously that can involve various different decisions that have to be made at the appropriate time um, around priorities in each hospital and that's what they're currently working through. I held yesterday with the Chief Clinical Officer of the HSA, Dr. Colm Henry, uh, two meetings with a number of our lead consultants, um, critical care consultants all across the country uh, to get their advice and continuously listen and we take the appropriate actions that they're recommending. One of the initiatives, simple initiatives which we feel we can invest in very quickly is just to give us national vi visibility of all our intensive care unit beds and capacity and utilisation all across the system which will be important but obviously hospitals are working through each of their individual plans and maximising the use of their ICU or high dependency units or 
post-operation resuscitation units and beds that they have and how they would prioritise in such a surge. And indeed transfer between hospitals or, or also uh, transfer the appropriate case to the National Isolation Unit in the matter. Just on our communications, very significant engagement with the public on our hse.ie site and indeed calls to our call uh, centre. Over 5,000 calls in the last few days alone. Over half a million visits to our hse.ie site this week. The half a million Facebook impressions and over a million impressions on Twitter. So the public are strongly engaging with us on our social media in particular. Um, from our own staff perspective, I just again want to thank all of the public health professionals, our GPs, indeed the pharmacies, consultants, uh, and indeed their own staff in the HSE uh, for the continuous mobilisation in a very relentless way uh, over the past few days. What I have said that this to our own staff yesterday, this is unprecedented in terms of this virus. It's unprecedented for a few reasons. Firstly, because it's a novel virus and we're learning about it as we go along and the experience of other countries and indeed ourselves. Secondly, it's unprecedented because the level of which the attack, the experience of how it <laughs> spread in other countries. And thirdly, it's unprecedented because it will have demands on all parts of our health system. Um, so it's not just, and that's the way we want to make it, that we have supports in our community, we have supports from our public health teams, and we have demands on our acute hospital se setting. So it is unprecedented. Just from our public communications, we will continue with our national, and from the HSE perspective, our national, local uh, media engagements and campaigns. And we will uh, very shortly be investing significantly in a radio uh, campaign uh, to create stronger awareness amongst the public. We're assessing the pros and cons, obviously, of TV advertisements and what we will need to do, uh, and public service, engaging with the public service provider in terms of public service announcements uh, on this virus. We've continuously referenced in all of our publications this week that we need to ensure that there is not a level of panic amongst the public and equally that there's not a level of complacency. Well, I would add a third piece into that level of a continuum of like, we need the public to act, to treat this very seriously and to act on all of the advice that we're given. And I'll restate that again. Firstly, go to hse.ie and look at all of the supports that's on that website. Secondly, in terms of hand cleanliness and washing of hands, go visit our site, look the proper way to do it, it makes a big difference. Secondly, in terms of coughing and sneezing, etiquette, obviously, cough into a tissue or sneeze into a tissue that can be disposed and dispose of it as soon as possible in a safe manner. And they're very important steps. And also the third one which we re-emphasize for people is to avoid touching your nose, your eyes, your mouth, your face in general. It is proven that this is how the virus spreads. So three very simple messages. But my message would be to the public, do heed our messages very carefully. We need you to act appropriately. We are still in a containment phase, but all experiences have shown this does move to a further phase. And we need the public to act on all of the advice we're given. Thank you very much. Okay, so the outbreak of novel coronavirus um, across the world is a public health emergency of international concern. And the World Health Organization has placed the risk now at very high in China at a regional level, which is Asia, and a global level. It's also very high. 
So this is a little bit technical but important. So the European Centre for Disease Control have now said that the risk of acquiring the disease for people in Ireland is currently considered low to moderate. The risk associated with COVID-19 infection for people in Ireland if they acquire it is considered moderate to high. The risk of occurrence of clusters, let's say similar to those that have happened in Italy, is currently considered to be moderate to high throughout the EU. The risk of widespread and sustained transmission of the virus in the EU and EEA in the coming weeks is moderate to high. And the risk for healthcare system capacity in the EU, EEA and UK in the coming weeks is considered to be moderate to high. So just on recent developments, the Republic of Ireland now has six confirmed cases of COVID-19. These were all associated with travel from Northern Italy. Northern Ireland has three cases, one associated with travel to Great Britain, but not an area of sustained community transmission. Extensive contact tracing is being conducted for all cases through the departments of public health. As you can appreciate, this is a very intensive and complex process, and we'd ask people to bear with us as uh, it, with the professionals as that is being undertaken. Home self-isolation of suspect cases and of cases, if it is appropriate in the home and in the clinical situation, is now being implemented. Also, as, as Paul mentioned, community testing is now being undertaken of suspect cases. Again, this is if it is considered uh, clinically appropriate. And there's increasing preparedness for the possibility of outbreaks or clusters or ongoing community transmission in Ireland. So just briefly, what does home self-isolation for cases or suspect cases mean? I think there's been a little bit of confusion around home self-isolation, which is recommended for cases, that is, people who have symptoms and who are at risk for transmission to others. So this is a more extreme version of what is recommended for con close contacts. So what is recommended is that people need to stay at home in their own room, with an open window, clean their hands often. If interaction with family members is absolutely necessary, they need to keep their distance and wear a face mask. To cover coughs and sneezes, finish and clean their hands. And other members of the household in this situation are close contacts and therefore they will be recommended to have limited social interaction. So this is for, so Self-isolation is for people with symptoms and it's to limit transmission of the virus. So limited so social interaction is what we're recommending for close contacts. So these are people who have been determined to be close contacts by a public health professional. And again, this is to limit the potential for spread of the virus to others. And what close contacts are asked to do is to stay at home, to not have visitors, not attend school, work, social, sporting events, training, crowd, crowded settings, not to use public transport, to avoid contact with people who might be vulnerable for complications, to restrict their travel, uh, no travel outside Ireland, and even within Ireland they need to discuss that with a Department of Public Health, uh, health doctor or nurse. But they may go outside. These are people who do not have symptoms. They may go outside on their own for walks, runs, or cycles. And other members of the household do not need to restrict their activities. So an update on the situation in numbers. Total of new cases. So globally now, we've over 93,000 cases. In China, it's still the vast majority, over 80,000, with 2,000, almost 3,000 deaths. And just to look again now at the European figures, we've almost two and a half thousand with 56 deaths. <coughs> so just in graphic form, again, this is number of cases by date. And you can see that the blue bar is China and the orange bar is outside of China. So just looking at that orange bar, it is increasing considerably. 
This is the distribution of cases by continent except China. And the orange bar is Asia, the gray bar is Europe. And again, you can see that is increasing significantly. And just to point out that there will soon be an epidemiological curve for Ireland. This is the geographic distribution of cases. So just COVID-19 or the novel coronavirus that causes it, it's a new disease, but we do know some things about it. There was a 2% death rate in confirmed cases in China, 2.9% in Hubei, considerably lower in other provinces. We know that the mortality rate is very high in the elderly and also in those with comorbid conditions. However, children seem to have quite mild disease and in fact, be relatively spared from infection. So there are a number of reasons why we're concerned about this virus. It's new, so we're still learning about it. There can be considerable individual and family impact. There's no vaccine for, for prevention and no treatment. Because it's new, everybody is susceptible. It will have considerable impact on health services. We know that from experience elsewhere. And if there are healthcare staff, that will also have an impact on healthcare services. It will also have considerable social and economic impacts. However, there are some things on our side. It has emerged elsewhere, so that has given us some time to gather some information, to find out about it, and also to prepare. We do have previous knowledge of other coronaviruses and other infectious diseases. So the principles of management will remain the same, whether that's from a public health perspective or a clinical perspective. And again, from a public health perspective, that approach is surveillance, monitoring, counting, getting detailed information, investigating each of the cases, implementing prevention measures, their public health measures, and control, also con public health measures. And we do know that many of these things work. We do have previous experience, pandemic influenza and SARS. We are in a developed world health healthcare system. And the other thing is, and I think it's really important to emphasize at this point, is that I think the Irish people are a nation who have solidarity and we have come through previous crises. So in terms of the epidemic phases and response interventions, at the moment we're at early detection and containment. So our response has been around gathering information and surveillance from elsewhere, and now we're commencing our own surveillance with our first number of cases. We will be gathering detailed information from all of them and that will start to build our own picture of cases here in Ireland. Preparedness across the healthcare system, whole of government and the public is happening and needs to continue to happen. We are still in the containment phase. This is really, really critical. Delay is really important in terms of helping us to prepare, but also slowing the impact on the healthcare system and as Paul mentioned, risk communication. I've mentioned this previously, the public health response around surveillance, investigation, prevention and control measures. So containment, we're currently in this phase and a strategy of containment is likely to continue as long as the number of introductions remains limited and there's no sustained community transmission of the virus or transmission only within sporadic contained clusters. As I say, delay and slowing of spread is a really important control measure, allowing for preparation and capacity building, information gathering, and for the ending of the flu season and the, demand that the, de the demands that it places on the healthcare system. I know there has been a lot of talk and discussion about how COVID-19 novel coronaviruses 
spread between people, but it's really, really important to reiterate it so that it can be directly from a sick, sick person's bodily fluids or indirectly by touching surfaces with droplets of the virus. And it's usually close human contact. So if you imagine I sneeze or cough and somebody's within close contact, that can land on the face, it can land on their hands, it can land here, it can land on my hands. So that's key to figuring out what we do to prevent transmission. That's why we don't want to touch our face because when we touch our face, it goes into the eyes, nose and mouth. That's how the virus infects me. So that's why washing your hands is critical. That's why not touching your face, cleaning objects and surfaces, not sharing objects. That's why all of those things will become critically important and everybody needs to be implementing these public health, what seem like apparently simple public health measures but in fact, in terms of the human condition, we need to learn how to make those standard everyday practice in a much bigger way than we've been practicing them heretofore. So there are a number of different public health measures. So there isn't a specific treatment and there are investigations underway to develop specific treatments um, and there isn't a vaccine, but there are things that we know which can help prevent the spread of infection and these have to be implemented by everybody so things like protecting ourselves again I mentioned cleaning the hands not touching the face these are always advised cleaning object cleaning surfaces not sharing objects well ventilated rooms always advised social distancing so that's talking about the fact that we know that it's within a one meter where transmission typically occurs so that's people starting to become aware of that and maintaining their distance where that's appropriate to do so. And it's also about uh, isolation. And as we move into the next phase, we will be saying that everybody, even with very mild symptoms, will need to be self-isolating. And people need to think about that going into the future is what does that mean for them? So they might be what feel they're fit to go to work, but they're a risk for spread of infection. So workplaces and each and every one of us needs to think about what that means for us. Again, other measures will need to be looked at from schools, work and mass gatherings. And what I would say is that everybody needs to think about how this will impact their school, their work and what they can do within those settings to prevent the spread of infection. Because the only way we're going to protect ourselves is by protecting all of us. Travel advice is currently in place. Um, we want everybody who's come from affected areas, if they are symptoms, have symptoms, uh, to contact a doctor. And anyone who hasn't got symptoms, if they develop them within two weeks, they need to contact their GP by phone. And again, talking about delay. Delay is also important in terms of the development of antiviral treatments and vaccine development. There will be some priority groups who we need to protect because we know they're, might, they're at higher risk of the complications and then also healthcare workers who we're going to be relying on uh, to care for the ill. So what next? We expect that this novel coronavirus will be spreading within our community within weeks. It's everybody's responsibility to protect public health. This is the only way we'll, we will protect ourselves and our healthcare system. And as I said, we, the onus is on all of us to protect those who are in vulnerable groups and to protect our healthcare workers by doing all the things what seem like very simple things, but by doing those all the time and learning and introducing them into our everyday life. So everybody needs to get ready. You need to think about how the virus is spread and think about how you can prevent it spreading within all settings, your home, work, schools, and in public places. And the other thing to think about is that control measures may need to be implemented 
either nationally but also you know regionally so if there seems to be sort of a, a you know an outbreak or a lot of cases in a particular setting the local specialists in public health medicine and directors of public health will be managing that situation and then sometimes things like school closures for example might be recommended people need to think about prioritization of work and about flexibility in roles So the symptoms of COVID-19, the common symptoms of infection include cough, shortness of breath, and breathing difficulties and fever. We know that in more severe cases, infection can cause pneumonia and severe acute respiratory syndrome, syndrome sometimes leading to death. We also know that in about 80% of cases, uh, disease, disease is mild and people recover. So how can I protect myself and others? Please stay up to date at ahse.ie. Avoid all but essential travel to affected areas. Wash your hands frequently with soap and water or alcohol hand rub. Cover your cough, dispose of the tissue. Wash your hands afterwards. Avoid touching your face with unclean hands. Avoid contact with anyone who is ill with a cough or difficulty breathing. If you're ill, stay at home, minimize your contact with others, especially those who have medical co conditions, are elderly or pregnant. Just coming back to the current phase, which is containment. It's what we call in technical terms, case finding. We're trying to find people who have cases so we can give them advice to prevent spread of infection and identify their contacts so that we can limit the spread. We want to contain it. So if you have traveled from an affected area. They are listed at hse.ie. The most common one at the moment for travel is, is from Northern Italy. If you travel in the last 14 days, if you have symptoms, isolate yourself at home. That means going into a room with a phone, contact your doctor by phone. They will give you further information and advice. If you have no symptoms, you may continue with your normal routine and see hse.ie for advice. Those who have no symptoms but have known close contact with a case or have been in a healthcare setting where cases are cared for should contact HSE Live for advice. This is for people who have travelled from affected areas. Obviously, close contacts of cases in Ireland will be proactively uh, followed up by public health staff. And I suppose the last thing I'd say is I'd appreci we'd appreciate your help in, in ensuring that uh, these messages are disseminated to the public. Thank you. Thank you, Sarah. Thank you. Um, so there's maybe a little overlap between what I'm saying, so I'll try to skip to it where there is overlap. Um, the first point of my presentation is almost always that I am bare below the elbows, so this is how we promote uh, practice now to, to reduce the risk of spread of all kinds of infections. Um, so a little bit about a virus, some of you may know this, it's about a thousand times smaller than a bacteria, so you can't see it. It can only multiply inside another living organism, so the virus may grow within me, but once it leaves me, it can't grow on the tabletop. If it lands on a table or a package, it can last for a while, um, but it won't grow there. Then there's a question of how long does the virus last on the tabletop, and it depends on the virus. So I describe some viruses as being like a hazelnut with a hard shell, and they last a long time, and some viruses are like a chocolate-covered hazelnut or a yogurt, and they are soft, and they don't last for a long time. Good thing about this one, insofar as things in our favor, is that this is a soft coated virus and it does not last for a long time in the environment. And that's quite important practically in terms of how we deal with it. In general terms, how do we stop a virus from spreading? Well, the first part is that we look after the people who are infected with the virus <coughs> in a way that reduces the amount of virus that escapes from that person. For example, somebody who has a cough or cold covers their nose or mouth, that captures most of the virus in the tissue. Um, we want to make sure that any virus that does escape from them doesn't land into the, in the eyes, nose or mouth of somebody else. 
because that's how it causes infection and that's about keeping distance. Um, we want to kill any virus that lands on surface and actually just basic detergent will kill most coronaviruses but we disinfect as well for extra precaution but actually these viruses are relatively easy to kill. Um, and then the other part about preventing viruses in general is if your immune system is ready before the virus gets to you, then you can't get infected. And that's what vaccines do, but we don't have a vaccine for this yet. So the coronaviruses are a big family of viruses. This is a new one, but it's a lot like the other coronaviruses. Some coronaviruses infect people, so if you had a cold in the last couple of years, there's a good chance that you may have been infected with a coronavirus because a lot of colds are caused by human common coronaviruses. There are other coronaviruses that infect animals, and what's happened here is that an animal coronavirus has crossed over into the human population, and of course, as Sarah has said, we don't have, then as human beings, we have no immunity to this virus because as human beings, we've not had to deal with this virus before. It's called corona because some people think that the pictures of it look like a crown. I can't see it myself, but that's why it's called a coronavirus. Um, so it's a lot like other coronaviruses, but differs in some details. So what I'm going to do now is we did a town hall meeting last week with the parents of one of the schools that was closed, a school that was closed, and, and there were a number of really good questions that came from the parents in that meeting, and I'm just going to reflect on some, what some of those questions were. So one of them was, if somebody in my household is a contact and they're advised to stay at home, why are you saying that it's safe for me to go about my normal life? That was one of the really good questions that we had. So the thinking here is that if I am a contact, then I might have the virus infection. The, the worry is that I might, actually many of us don't, but I might have the virus. If I am infected with the virus today, the virus has to grow in me for a number of days before I can give the virus to anybody else. And in so far as we know experience so far, I usually don't shed much of the virus until I start to have symptoms. So I start to get the runny nose or the sore throat. Nothing is perfect, but generally speaking, not much virus is leaving me until I get. So if I'm a contact, I may have the virus, but as long as I'm well, the chance that I'm shedding virus is quite low. So we expect that if we have 100 contacts for the sake of round number, we expect that most of those 100 people are actually not infected. Of those people who are infected, we expect that they're probably not going to be shedding the virus until they start to feel unwell. Um, and, and if they do shed the virus and they give it to somebody in their house, that person isn't going to shed the virus for a few days after that. Is that the, 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 so, so therefore, if I am living in the house of a contact, but the person who is a contact as well, the chance that I'm taking that virus outside is so low that our advice is that it's reasonable for you to live your life as normal in that, in that setting. So, so that's the reasoning that underlies the advice. Okay, another big question that came up, and, 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 and this is a really good question as well, is why don't you just get all the contacts and test them? And then you would know if they had infection or not. And the answer is that it doesn't work like that. I wish it did. It would be much better. So how do we test for coronavirus? Well, the test is based on taking a special type of swab from the nose or throat. The lab then gets the swab, and they test that swab to see if there's any virus genes on the swab. If there's enough virus genes on the swab, the test gives a signal. If you like, the light comes on. If there aren't enough virus genes in the sample, there's no signal, the light doesn't come on. If the light doesn't come on, that doesn't prove there's no virus there. What it means is that there's not enough virus for the test to detect. And that's really important because the test is either positive or it's not detected. It's not negative. There are no negatives. So if I am a contact and I have a test and the test comes back, we didn't find any virus. There's no reassurance there that if you test me tomorrow, you won't find the virus. So testing everybody sounds like a good idea, but in fact it isn't because that's not, the test doesn't work like that. 
So that's the answer to why do we not test everyone. The test works well for people who've got symptoms because usually you start to shed a lot of the virus when you start to have a runny nose or a sore throat and you're shedding enough virus at that point for the test to work well. Before that, you may have the virus, but the amount that's coming out is so low that the test is not reliable. That isn't to say it will never work, but it's not reliable, and, and, and that's the experience we've seen from, from countries who've done this. So if you test me as a contact and the light doesn't come on, there is a danger of giving a false sense of assurance that I'm clear, but that's not what the test means. So that's the explanation why we don't just test everyone. Another question, which was, you know, one of the, was one of the things that was very striking in the town hall meeting was just the impact that this has on the lives of people. And, and so for people who are in households where there is somebody who has a chronic disease or some other vulnerability to disease, what does this mean for them? And the question was, if somebody in my house is already sick, are they at increased risk? And the answer is, they're probably no more likely to catch the infection, but the consequences of catching the infection could be more serious. And as I said to people on Monday night, I'd love to be able to take that away, but there is, you can't sugarcoat that. That is the truth. If you have a pre-existing bad lung disease, then the consequences of catching this virus could be more serious for, for, for you. But the way you protect yourself is the same and one of the questions then was, well, what about if we take various vitamins and so on? And I guess my answer to that would be, for in times like this, there are a lot of people who are going to sell you snake oil. Um, and a lot of the snake oil doesn't work, but people are trying to sell you. So, so I think hse.ie is giving you the advice that we believe is the best advice we can give you, and we're not trying to sell you anything. So be careful where you get your advice. Uh, um, because unfortunately, what you can do to protect the vulnerable person in your, in your house is the same as what you can do for everyone else, which is if somebody's coughing or sneezing, tissue or cover and hand hygiene and keep your hands away from your nose. So it's the same things that work, but the consequences can be more severe. That's, that's, that's how it is, and, 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 and it, is, it is very worrying for people who've got a vulnerable person in their house. In theory, the person could decide to live elsewhere and that would reduce their risk, but for many of us, that's simply not practical because we live at home, we live with people we love, we don't want to live somewhere else, and that's the practicality of, of life. Um, can contacts in isolation go outside? And Sarah has touched on this, and the answer is, if you've got two young people who are home from the same school and they want to go to a field where there's nobody else and play ball together, of course they can because they're actually living in the same house. So provided they're not playing ball with a bunch of other people, if there's some place quiet that they can go and kick a ball around and burn off some energy, that's good for them, it's good for everyone, and it doesn't increase the risk to anyone because they live in the same house. If they want to go for a run, as long as they're not interacting with anybody else, that's fine because it doesn't put anybody else at risk. If virus comes out of your nose while you're running around in the grass, the chances of it surviving on the grass long enough for anyone to catch it, are so remote that we don't think it's something we need to be concerned about. Is there a risk for me if I live in the house with somebody who is contact? So if I have been in touch with somebody who is infected, I am a contact. That means I may be infected and I may start to shed the virus at some point over the next few days. Is there a risk to you if you live with me? There is a risk to you if you live with me but it's a risk that most of us accept in terms of ordinary living, of living with our family. And if you're living with somebody, it is a risk that doesn't go away, but that, that, is, a, that is a risk. And that's why we ask contacts to limit their social interactions. So summary then, how do we stop respiratory viruses from spreading? And Sarah has touched on this. Again, the key thing to remember about this virus is to get into you, it has to stick on to your mu mucous membranes. It has to stick on to your eye, the inside of your nose or the inside of your mouth. Getting onto your skin is not enough for this virus. If it gets onto your skin, you then have to put it in with your hand to your eye, your nose, or your mouth. So if you do your hands and you make sure that you do them right so that you get all the virus off and there is a drill that you have to do if you're going to do that. And if you do that, then you can be pretty sure that when you do put your hands to your mouth that you've washed the virus away. Thank you.
Okay, so um, a lot of information there, and um, I think it's very good that this is being streamed, uh, and uh, hopefully lots of people will get to see that very useful information. Uh, as Martin said, that was a that was part of the feedback from an audience of about 600 parents um, last uh, Monday night, and uh, some. Useful information there, so thanks for that, Martin. And you have, do you have to leave? Um, I have to leave in five minutes. In five minutes, okay. Okay, so in terms of uh, questions, can I just ask, because there's a row of cameras in front of all of you, I might find it hard to see you, so can I ask if you've got questions, if you could stand up, uh, introduce yourself so everybody knows who's who. Just take the second question first of all, yesterday, and it was kind of soft launch, we had about 17 tests uh, done throughout yesterday. And again, I would stress that home testing is done based on the advice of our, our public health uh, team. So it would be a contact through the HSE uh, number and then our public health advice would be, uh, that's generally where it happens, but look at hse.ie and you'll see the information in terms of that. So. Uh, steady start on it but I think it will be a really important service that we're putting in at a very early stage. Just on the wider question as you know in terms of the cases in Edify last night we're still in the process of working through uh, significant progress overnight in terms of contacts and traceability and, and the contact tracing and that progress is working very well but still more to do on it and I think you'll appreciate that's the position that we need to sustain right now while we walk through that process. There will be, as you know, another press conference at five o'clock with the National Public Health Emergency Team. And should should we be in a further position at that stage? Obviously, we will. Uh, but right now, as we have done throughout the week, we need to protect the confidentiality of all the cases that we've had to date. And I, I think that's right, appropriate, um, for many, many reasons. And I think it's been the right case earlier on this week with the case that we had, is the right approach. And I would, in fairness, thank the media for the responsive way in which you responded through that process earlier on the week and that's really what we need to get through this phase with the recent cases identified. Okay Paul I'll give you one follow on one. You're, you're okay. So just be clear that five o'clock one is determined by uh, by <coughs> UH and Neffet so as those of you who are following this closely um, that's liable to change based on circumstances not, not saying that it will but it's planned for five o'clock. I catch the one on PG Karen is on. I catch the Martin and Paul Martin Cormac and how the Fader Liver Rod Lady Queen Kid across I knew in the year and cheated in yay. I did you in the year and cheated in yay. Well, Dirac uh, Maradour Paul called me to be on Cormac, come privadicus Nadine Shin a co. Is Rod Fear Tabak to go go will Dini Sasta Chuck con Kin con Antasta la Glapa. Agus uh, ta dolgus arin uh, an privadicus a coho in a school dini sasta a yenov. So Neil Mead sasta fuckle nis mo na a door spal or off we na kasna shin uh, Maria Olishin. Okay, good morning. Uh, chap at the back there. Yeah. Ron Smith, Irish Daily Mail. Um, just in back to the isolation of the units and isolation of beds, um, obviously more funny than uh, given to ICU, but I just wonder if you could tell me at this very moment how many isolation beds are there in Irish hospitals out there? Currently, we have a total of 240 
five isolation unit beds all across the system. Um, along, and so these will be incremental to that. Can I ask, just follow up, um, so the, we have six cases in the country at the moment, are all of them being moved from the national isolation unit in the matter as a uh, like first one to call or are they being spread out around the system? They're being treated as relevant with each case, so it's it, it's all case dependent in terms of where they're being treated and that's, that's the approach that we'll continue to take. Obviously our national isolation unit in the matter has a greater capacity and that's where we're investing further in that as well. But each case would be treated at the appropriate place. Just on the first question, Stephen, the schools are not in position to confirm the number of schools. This is really live and active as we're working through the contact tracing. Uh, so the number of schools I can't confirm right now. That process is still going on, indeed, by our public health teams uh, right this minute. So we're not in a position to confirm it. Uh, I think it's appropriate, again, when we are in a position, we will. Uh, but right now, that process is still ongoing. On the second one, on the mass gatherings document, if people haven't heard from our public health teams in terms of cancellation mass gatherings, it should still continue. Uh, that process is still being worked through in terms of finalising the approach to overall mass gatherings. Uh, so if people haven't heard, people are seeking our advice in terms of gatherings that they're having, and we're giving advice generally. So any event that's planned that hasn't been asked by ourselves uh, should still progress and are, and are still progressing. And so with three schools earlier, has that changed? I can't, can't confirm right now because I, I will say we're still, you'll appreciate the contact tracing takes time uh, over a number of intense period last night and throughout today. And that is, you know, a dialogue, a discussion uh, with the people involved. And, and you, know, you know, in many cases it can take some time. So that process is still ongoing. So I can't confirm right now while we're still in the tracing and phase. Do you have a rough number of how many people have been identified through the contact tracing? No, we can't give it. As you realise, it's, it's, it, it was an overseas, so we, we obviously the flight involved and the various uh, engagements since then. So I can't confirm the number, but it, it, you know, it's a quite intense process going on overnight and throughout, right as we speak. I think it's fair to say that if we gave you a number right now, by the time this press conference is finished, that number will have changed. So best to wait until the process is finished. Okay, anybody else? George? Yeah. Um, just in terms of I suppose one follow-on question to that last question, firstly, apart from schools, have any other institutions or organisations been asked to close in relation to the cases uh, in the West? Okay, well, just again, not to make um, s specific comment on any particular case, but just in a, in a theoretical way, the contact tracing involves a detailed interview with the case, and they are asked about the time period over which they have had symptoms and then all the people who have potentially been exposed to the novel coronavirus are identified through that and it's done by a risk assessment by somebody who is expert in doing this and has done it on previous occasions for other infections whether viral or bacterial. So the people are identified either as close contacts or as casual contacts and an institution would not necessarily need to be closed on foot of the contact tracing it does depend on the movements of the case and the kind of contacts that they have had so does that mean that no other organization or institution apart from schools because we know some schools have been asked to close no other organization or institution has been asked to well, as I say, I was just commenting, so, you know, in a theoretical way, you know, that it, it is specialists in public health medicine and directors of, in public health who will make those decisions based on the particular circumstances of the case on a risk assessment and on their previous experience and knowledge. Okay. And I think and the, and and I George, just yeah. to that, I think the previous answer applies here. 
which is this is a very fluid situation. And, uh, and in any case, we're not in the business of identifying locations, facilities, that type of thing, because we narrow down identifying individuals if we do that. Okay. Although, and just to, but, but just to reassure, and that is the case, and that is always our approach, but to reassure people, because I think people then ask, well, what if, and what if I don't know, or what if they didn't, or they were on a, a bus, and they can't say who they're in touch with. If it is necessary from a public health perspective, then we would issue a call, we would issue that information. If it is necessary to protect public health, we would do that. Well, I just have a linked kind of question, and you may end up giving me the same kind of answer, but I would ask you anyway. It, can you give us any indication of the number of people who've been asked so far to self-isolate? No. no. And the, the answer to that is we're not giving a, a number Okay. Many, so pe many people are keep, being asked to self-isolate, and again, mm -hmm. it's a, and for the protection of public health. And again, I, I think it's been well respected this week. I, I don't have the finer details of it just now, but you know, we are getting information of a social media post of someone who is going through a test with our community um, public health teams and posted on Facebook, or posted on a social media site by someone. You know, that's that's what we want to avoid. That's it's stigmatising areas, stigmatising. Uh, schools are stigmatizing people is not where we need to end up in this process and that's what we're trying to protect against well, one final question Paul, if you don't mind the issue of information and the vagueness of the information that people are getting um, as you say there are people on social media and also schools sending out texts to hundreds of parents at times telling them about closures and yet for the information that we're officially getting is much more vague than that and the key issue, or the key question would be, in, in terms of the vagueness, for instance, the west of the country, uh, it could cause its own problems in terms of panic and anxiety as well. So striking the balance is a very difficult thing. I'm wondering whether or not you think it's been too vague so far, because it gets to the point that it's, it's very difficult even for media to decide <coughs> where to come down on this line. There's lots of things been written which are very specific and then been changed, I've seen them myself, because maybe they're too specific originally. And then there are issues in relation to whether the media who might have heard something can't show or should not be reporting. So there's so much confusion. At the root of it is the vagueness and getting the balance right in terms of what you're trying to do. Are we being too vague? Are you being too vague? Is the Department of Health being too vague for our own good? I appreciate the requirement and the demand for a, a lot of people to have very detailed information and as you quite rightly said we have to find the balance between what's right for the wider public good and equally respect the uh, people that we're dealing with in terms of positive test cases and I think overall we found that balance well this week and again I will thank the media overall for their support uh, during this week and that process because we've all had children in our relations through school and, and kids worry you know, and we don't want you know children wor worrying unnecessarily. Uh, we don't want public. So where people need to know and are involved directly, they will be contacted very rapidly, and that's happened again last night and today. Uh, and then the wider messages for us, the biggest thing we are urging the public to do right now is what we're relentlessly saying in terms of hand cleanliness, coughing, uh, sneezing etiquette, and touching the hands and face. That's the biggest call no to arms to the wider public, everywhere. Okay, and one absolutely final question, I promise you. Are you aware of any new cases today? Because there were four yesterday. Have you been informed of any potential or any new cases which have been identified so far? Throughout every day, we work with the National Viral Reference uh, Laboratory and tests emerge towards the back end of the day. That's exactly the phase that we're in now. We will be in every day for now, for the foreseeable future in terms of getting information on cases. So we, we wait uh, feedback and information from the, the labs. The it's usually later in the day and they emerge. Okay. Paul. Um, what exactly are the rules for healthcare workers returning back to some parts of the world where the coronavirus is, is transmitting in those communities? Okay, so we're asking any healthcare workers who are traveling back from affected areas to contact their local Department of Public Health and they will be advised 
from a number of areas, we are asking them not to go to work. If they're returning from a number of high-risk areas, we are asking them not to go for, to work for 14 days after their return. It's, it's quite a complex assessment, but we're asking everybody who's returning from affected areas when they return um, to contact their Department of Public Health and receive appropriate advice. And the reason for that, and that it differs from other people, is because they're caring for high risk, for people who are at risk of complications. It depends on certain criteria that will be determined by the specialist in public health medicine who discusses that with them. So there's there are case specific criteria. It depends on where they've come from and the kind of exposure that they may have had. Well, I mentioned Northern Italy, for example. What is the rule for Northern Italy? It depends on whether they're coming from the towns in that are under um, hmm. the, the kind of common terminology is lockdown. But it depends yeah. on... So, it, so it's based on a risk assessment of their um, exposure. <coughs> if they come from... The, if they've been in 11 towns, they stay at home for two weeks. But if they're in other parts of Northern Italy, that is not a requirement. No, there's a, they do stay at home for two weeks, but they, those who come from the 11 towns have active follow-up from uh, their Department of Public Health. They'll be contacted every day. Those who, um, who return from Italy from areas outside of those towns are asked to stay at home um, and report if they develop symptoms. Okay, it's it's compli if you want to have a chat afterwards rather than just bog down the entire Q and A session, we can have a chat afterwards if that's okay. Anybody? Is it is it true that a health professional is um, uh, has come back from one of those areas and is? Um, George, you know the answer to this. We're not going to comment on individuals. Thank you. Paul, oh, yes. mentioned, and there was a question George asked about the vagueness and saying that he's returned. This is the right approach. So by saying, you know. Uh, children worry. So I know I got loads of texts last night, so obviously the case we know where, where, where the case is, but obviously we're not saying it. You had children in other counties, or parents in other counties in the West. The West is a, is a big area. So more people are actually worrying than, say, people in a specific county or specific, you know, even the region smaller than, than the West. No, because any of the principals who contact us, and there's been quite a lot, you know, and we will engage with principals and reassure in terms of the opening of the particular school, if they have any concerns whatsoever, and that's quite that happens, and we reassure reassure the public, reassure principals uh, that their school is fine, you know, carry on as they have been. So, you know, again, it's 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 finding this balance between the public calm in terms of what we need right now. Uh, where we are still in a containment phase, it's an important phase we want to stay in for as long as we possibly can, reassuring the public. There's a wider call to arms to everybody here. So it's not just about affected areas. And again, I will, will restate, it's important we don't start, areas don't become stigmatised. And, you know, social media has a role to play in that. And, and we, as public officials and public health officials, have a role to play in it. So, you know, it's finding that important balance. But I would rather be talking right now to the wider public, which can make a massive impact in helping us contain this right now and leave the public health officials to deal with the particular cases that we're dealing with and the contacts that have been traced. That's for the public health officials. For me, as CEO of the HSE, it's a wider call to everybody. Just with the poignant cases, you said there's been significant tracing challenges. Obviously, even in broad terms, can you go into a little bit about what those challenges have been? Look, I think simply because you're dealing with uh, multiple cases that alone you know raises a lot of challenges together and as you, as you said yesterday it's in a cluster so you know you're dealing with multiple cases and interactions so that's the complexity of it. And then the extra personnel for the trace bit of the exercises going forward or people redeployed from other government departments? Yeah we're, we're taking steps on a daily basis to make sure that the public health teams have sufficient resources that has involved bringing in extra staff uh, up to including yesterday uh, we've deployed more staff in and we'll continue to deploy the appropriate staff 
anywhere across the health service that's required for this for this phase and for any phase we enter. Do you think social media companies are doing a lot to take down the kind of misinformation going around? Yeah, I, I mean, I let Paul kind of publicly comment on that, but we have had really good support, uh, you know, so far in terms of what's been out there. Obviously, we have to get into engagements with well, what is true and what's not true and, and those challenges, but I think to date, Paul, I think it's fair to say. Yeah, so we've, we've made some uh, complaints, pretty much where they're egregious, we will make a complaint, um, and the social media platforms have been quite responsive. As we go forward, we'd hope to have greater engagement because this is going to get busier. We've seen some really, really um, inappropriate um, postings going up there, which pretty much gets very close to identifying individuals, and that we will find to be pose a particular problem for us. I think the key thing uh, to go back to some of the points about why why we don't provide particular information uh, is because we don't want to identify individuals because we want people to have trust in the authorities so that if they come forward, if they come back from a particular area, we want them to have confidence that the public authorities will protect their identities as much as possible. If we get to a situation where people don't feel that trust, well then there's a, probably a chance that people won't come forward. So we've got to be very conscious of that. We've got to make sure that if people feel that if they've come back from an area, they may have sentences, they need to come forward. That will help us to slow this down. That will help us to contain this. And as Sarah said earlier, this is all about time at this stage. Time to allow us to learn more about the virus and to help us to prepare and scale up so as we can deal with it. It's coming, but if we can delay it for as long as possible, I think we'll be in a better position to deal with it. Paul, oh, you spoke there about the inappropriate postings. Are these coming from like just members of the public or just healthcare people? That you mentioned Paul, about a, about something like that, testing? Or yeah, I died. Or Sorry. Sorry, Stephen. I, I don't have the full details of it, but you know it would be a kind of cause of concern if we start to get into that phase of uh, people putting public postings of tests carrying out or naming people or naming individuals. You know that that would be a serious cause of concern, which we would address with the relevant platform. So that that would be a complaint this afternoon that only came to light um, before we started this. It seems to have come from a member of the public. Uh, it seems to be a video. It seems to be inappropriate material in terms of privacy, identification of, per of the person, and we will we will make a complaint. Um, how many complaints have you made so far? Uh, I don't have that number. I can get that for you. Okay, where are we going? John, here you've been hanged up for a while, yeah? Uh, Peter Fanning of Bloomberg News. There's been various reports of, uh, you know, office workers being tested and some offices have sent everyone home so the re results come back. Others are just continuing business as usual. Is there specific guidance on how companies should act in those situations? Would you prefer everyone to be sent home, or is it, you know, even so? I mean, again, so if somebody is a suspect case, if they're being tested, um, they that will be done by their own doctor, or you know, in 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 an emergency department or now by the ambulance service but they will be assessed by um, a specialist in public health medicine or other public health doctor and um, an assessment then made of I mean if they're considered to be very high risk um, there may be some recommendations made at that point but in general um, that person who sorry that they're asked to self-isolate in their room and pending the results of the test and some preliminary information is gathered about contacts and then once the confirmed result is uh, received then contact tracing takes place but in just in terms of the company if, if you know one person in, in, a, in, a, in an office block is being tested there's no concern you wouldn't recommend that everyone be sent home until the results come through right? no i mean again that like in all of these situations, there's an immediate assessment being done and risk assessment being done and, and, and public health advice ensues from that. So I suppose what we're asking people is to trust that there are professionals doing this who have done it many, many times previously for other 
uh, infections, whether bacterial or viral, for example, measles, open TB, E. coli, meningitis. It varies depending on the particular infection and how people are exposed and how it's transmitted. So the way we do our contact tra tracing depends on all of that. So this will be, is based on what we know about the infectiousness of this particular virus and the people that we consider to be exposed. And then the advice is given on that basis. Can I just, just make a brief point, not in a kind of business context, but back to a point I think Sarah made and, and Martin as well earlier on, in a community context. I mean, I think one thing that is on our side uh, in terms of the, the phase that we're in right now is there is a good community ethos and spirit in Ireland. You know, it quite differentiates us, and I say that having come from a local government position. So, you know, when we galvanise communities, it can be very powerful, and I think this is one... Uh, virus that will really benefit from the communities taking ownership of it and uh, combating it and doing it. So that's genuinely a call for me. That's you know that's really galvanised the communities uh, to do what we're asking them to do. Okay, are we nearly there? Okay, guys. Um, so if we talk to Mary about uh, interviews at the end of it, please, um, rather than everybody pouncing on individuals. Order, we like it. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, sure, yeah.